Hello, everyone. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on your time zone, but or good evening. Welcome to the Patia, Collo Patia Colloquium. There is a, there was a break last week because of a of a conference Astro 2022 that you can you can see still the video for the conference last week on the ISO Cosmic Duologue uh, YouTube channel. Uh, it was a very interesting and exciting week. But now we are back to our excellent early career scientist. We are very happy to host two new talks this week. I, let me just remind it to our attendees that you can make your question or comments either using the online. Uh, chat on YouTube if you are watching from YouTube, or you can use the chat inside the Zoom meeting if you are joining via Zoom. Please, to the people on Zoom, on Zoom please be aware that we are broadcasting on YouTube. So if you are comfortable with that, uh, you can please leave the, 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 the leave the, the meeting. Then you can still, as I said, watch the event on YouTube. Um, if you want to make questions also anonymously, you can do that. There is a form online. I put the link on the on the on the YouTube channel. You can you can watch the you can still send the, the, your comment or questions and they will be passed through the to the to the chair anonymously. Today it's very it's a pleasure first of all to congratulate again with Giovanni and Sofia who are the two speakers of today. They will be introduced by our chairs and the chair of today is Julia Julia uh, actually sorry Julia Seidel and Alice uh, Sumigliana. Julia and Alice they are a fellow and the students at ISO. Julia is a fellow in Chile. Alice, Alice is here, a fellow at ISO Garking. So thank you very much to both Julia and Alice to, to, to chairing, for chairing the session and to making this possible and to helping us. And with this, I, I won't go further and just leave the floor to Julia, to Julia to make the introduction to the event. Thank you very much and enjoy. Thank you so much, Giacomo. Uh, welcome everybody also from my side. Um, as, as as was already said, we have two speakers today, and the first one is Giovanni Granata, who is a second year PhD student at the very lovely University of Milan. And he's going to tell us a little bit more about the improved strong lensing modeling of galaxy clusters using the fundamental plane. And he'll talk more specifically about ABLE S1063. So uh, Giovanni, the floor is yours. You have 25 minutes if you want to share your screen. I hope you can see well the screen. Okay. Can you see the slides going on? Yes. All right. So uh, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for to the organizers for uh, for planning this very interesting series of talks and following them with with care and interest. And I'm very glad to be taking part in this. So since I was already introduced, I'll cut to the chase and go straight to the talk, which, as the title suggests. Uh, will focus on the current state of the art of strong density modeling of galaxy clusters, and in particular on how they can be used uh, to accurately map the mass distribution of dark matter in their cores, which is a crucial test of the standard cosmological model. So let's start with an outline of what I'm going to touch on. So we'll commence with, uh, with a bit of a motivation. Why are we interested in galaxy clusters if we want to study dark matter, and why strong lensing is a very well suited tool to do so? Secondly, we'll see what's the state of the art in terms of strong density modeling of massive clusters. And then what are the most more recent developments in these techniques, particularly focusing on the dark matter distribution on a galaxy scale. Here is where my recent paper currently, which is joint work with the Clash VLT collaboration, currently impressed for astronomy and astrophysics will factor in. I will tell you something more about it too. And finally, we'll come full circle, seeing how uh, the results of strong density models can be compared uh, with the most recent cosmological simulations to test uh, the standard cosmological model and our hypothesis on the nature of dark matter itself. So as I said, we start with a bit of a motivation. Why are we interested in clusters if we want to study dark matter? I'll give you two very simple answers. The first one is that we look at the various components of the cluster. Dark matter dominates it. Actually, baryons make up only less than 15% of the mass of galaxy clusters. And I like what this Hubble image of Abel 63 might suggest to you, it's not the stars that dominate them, stars only make up around one to 2% of the total mass, and they're of course found in the various member galaxies. The remaining baryonic component is uh, a hot gas, which occupies a significant portion of the cluster core. The remaining 85% of the, the mass of galaxy clusters is instead under the form of dark matter. Dark matter is found in clumps, in halos, 
uh, and we see two different scales for the dark matter clumps. Cluster scale halos, which occupy significant portions of the cluster. They're very massive. Their mass can be up to 10 to the 15 solar masses. And then each of the various member galaxies is itself hosted by a smaller galaxy scale halo, uh, which we will often refer to as subhalo. That was the first answer. The second answer is that, unlike many other objects, it is possible in galaxy clusters to estimate the mass distribution of all the baryonic components just from observations. On one hand, uh, the hot gas uh, has temperatures of up to 10 to the 7 Kelvin and a very well-known Bremsstrahlung emission. So from X-ray images of the cluster, we can map the mass distribution of the hot gas of the intracluster medium. Uh, as for the stellar mass of the cluster members instead, it can be derived from the spectral energy distribution in optical and near infrared bands. This is, for instance, the surface brightness of the cluster members, again, of other less than 63, in one of the Hubble bands, combining several of these allows us to obtain an estimate of the uh, stellar mass of all the members. Well, but what's the, what does this mean? Well, uh, it means that if we have, if we find a tool, a probe, which is sensitive to the total mass distribution of the cluster, then the, that of the dark matter can be disentangled by subtracting the baryonic mass distribution to the total mass distribution. And as far as the cores of massive clusters are concerned, the best suited tool to do so is strong gravitational lensing. So strong lensing is gravitational lensing, like deflection uh, by the gravitational potential of the cluster. And we refer to it as strong as, such as in this, in this video, it creates multiple paths for the light of background objects to reach us. And the result is that, as in this case for Rubble 3A3, we see multiple images of, in this case, the background galaxy. So as the positions of these multiple images uh, depend on the gravitational potential uh, of the lens, uh, if we know the right shifts, then uh, their position gives us a very strong uh, constraint on the total mass of the lens of the cluster that they enclose. So uh, th this is a very simple system, a very simple situation with just two images. But in realistic cases, we can have a, a much more complicated morphology. All the numbers here, this is the massive cluster of max j 416 all the numbers here indicate multiple images of background objects. There are uh, probably at least 100 of them just in this image. And each of them, therefore, gives us um, an estimate of the total mass of the cluster in the region in which it appears, which means that by combining all the information they give us, we can derive a total mass density profile uh, for the cluster, which is what we need to disentangle the dark matter mass distribution. This procedure has two main caveats. The first one is that multiple images appear in the core of clusters. Uh, how, so for instance, these images are around 500 kiloparsecs wide. Uh, there are other methods for the outskirts. And anyway, this is also the region where there's the highest density of cluster members and therefore the highest number of uh, dark matter halos. So it's a very interesting region for us. Uh, the second is instead, I will, the second caveat I will show you with these two brief videos is that uh, there's a strong degeneracy between the mass of the lens and the redshift of the source. So uh, in both cases, I'm simulating the two images of a background source, which is fixed behind the spherical lens. In this video here on the left, I'm just changing the mass of the lens, which is increasing. And you see that the two images get further and further away from the lens center. But if I keep the lens mass fixed and increase the source redshift, as you see, I obtain exactly the same effect. The only way to break this degeneracy is that uh, I don't just need to measure the positions of the multiple images. Uh, which we observe, of course, with photometric data. I also need to know with precision what the redshifts. And this is best done, of course, with spectroscopic redshifts. So photometry and spectroscopy has to be combined uh, to build an accurate strong lensing model of the cluster. And this is a bit of an overarching theme, which uh, will appear uh, again and again. Uh, we need both photometry and spectroscopy if we want to establish well the structure of the cluster. Photometry tells us where the various cluster members are with respect to the cluster center, but it's spectroscopy that allows us to identify cluster members from foreground and background objects, again, through their redshifts. And finally, as we'll see, good progress is being obtained by using information on the cluster members <clears throat> in terms of structural parameters and velocity dispersion, so morphology and kinematics of the cluster members to better constrain their mass, which again requires both photometry and spectroscopy. So what's the current state of the art in terms of data availability? Well, as far as Hubble Space Telescope Imaging, the two main surveys which I will cite, which in the recent years focused 
on the course of massive lens clusters were CLASH, uh, which focused on 25 massive clusters observing 16 bands, and the Hubble Frontier Fields, which uh, restricted the sample of clusters, just six of them, you can see them all here, uh, and just using just seven bands, but went much deeper than CLASH, so obtaining higher resolution and uh, images than it was possible before. One of the Frontier Fields clusters is Hubble SN63, which we already saw and will see again uh, during the course of this presentation. As for the spectrography instead, I will again cite two surveys, both at the VLT. The first one is Clash VLT, which uh, used BIMOS, focusing on 13 Clash clusters and identifying up to 500 members per each cluster. So this is the BIMOS view of uh, Max J0416. All the blue dots indicate foreground and background objects, while the red dots indicate cluster members. And you see how this really gives us a whole third dimension to this image. Uh, a great step forward in terms of model complexity has been allowed uh, by uh, MUSE, which is instead, unlike BIMOS, an integral field spectrograph with a very high resolution and small pixels. And uh, the fact that the main, uh, of course, the main distinction is that the field of view is smaller. BIMOS has a 30 at minutes field of view, uh, 30 at minutes wide. This is just an at minute square. But remember that we are still mostly focusing on the cluster cores. And if we zoom in on that, we see how here in pink, I've underlined the two MUSE pointings for max j 416 You see how in most of the cases for massive clusters, one or two MUSE pointings are enough to cover a great portion of the cluster core. Why is this such a great step forward? Well, because being an integral field spectrograph, it allows for a blind search of multiple images and cluster members. And this is especially crucial for very thin multiple images. So this is still the same redshift space projection of the cluster. All the pink dots here indicate uh, redshift that have, be, have been measured by MUSE. And look how deep they are. Uh, we even see some objects at redshifts greater than three, thanks to the detection of Lyman alpha emissions. And well, uh, I anticipated how basically each of the multiple images that we consider gives us an estimate on the, uh, the total mass of the cluster in a certain region. So the higher is the number of images that we have, the higher is the resolution of the total mass profile that we can obtain. And this is the great pro progression, the great progress that was allowed for as far as Max J0416 is concerned by the arrival of integral field spectrography for, uh, for this core. So the first Clash VLT model that was published was based on 30 multiple images from eight background sources. This number jumped to more than 100 multiple images with the first news data. And there's now in preparation a new model uh, with uh, a new deeper pointing, new deeper news pointings, which uh, will take advantage of 235 multiple images from 88 background sources. So a very high resolution uh, total mass profile for the cluster. But how do we proceed in practice? Well, again, I will describe a parametric approach. And uh, as I said, the positions of the multiple images depend on the gravitational potential, the total gravitational potential of the cluster, which is by itself, a linear quantity. So this is a linear problem. We can see the total gravitational potential as the sum of the gravitational potentials of the various components. So the sum of the gravitational potentials of the various diffuse cluster scale dark matter halos, the sums of the gravitational potentials of the gas, the intercluster medium halos. Uh, these are introduced with uh, mass density profile, with ellipsoidal mass density profiles. And then, of course, there's the various member galaxies whose mass distribution is modeled instead of usually this with spherical mass density profiles. So the, of course, each of these mass density profiles, we have a certain set of three parameters. The parameters of the hot gas and stellar distribution are fixed from the observations, while the parameters of the dark matter halos are optimized. And the optimization is performed using a chi-square, which compares the observed positions of the multiple images that we consider with the, with the model predicted ones. So the best fit model is the one that allows for the best reproduction of the observed uh, multiple images that we consider. So in this way, when we find the best fit set of parameters, even for the dark matter components, uh, we already have uh, the composition available. We can uh, consider the expressions for the mass density of each of the various cluster mass components. And uh, for instance, if we look at the more recent model of Hubble S1063, this is the total surface mass density, considering all the various components projected on the lens plane, this is what we obtain if we only consider the mass density, the surface mass density of the two diffused dark matter halos. You see it's a post-merger cluster, a bit like looking at the bullet cluster from the side. And this is instead 
uh, the surface mass density of dark matter halos on a galaxy scale of the various cluster members. And from this, we can obtain, for instance, uh, mass fractions. Uh, these are the in red the stellar to total mass fraction, uh, the gas to total mass fraction in green, and the baryonic to total mass fraction, uh, starting from the center of the BCG, these are cumulative, out to a projected radius of 350 kiloparsecs. And you see how, uh, and you see how at, at, this, at this radius, uh, the total baryonic fraction is already pretty close to the cosmological value. Now, what you might be wondering, though, is how many parameters do we need to do this? Uh, recent models are getting more and more complex as far as the number of cluster members is concerned. We are considering up to a few hundreds of cluster members. And the way we model cluster members, as I anticipated, is by a spherical mass density profiles that are isothermal near the centers and then truncated in the outskirts uh, and are defined by two three parameters, uh, the velocity dispersion, which is a density and concentration scale, and the truncation radius, which is a half mass radius for the dark matter component. And uh, we, we really can't have two free parameters for 200 cluster members, so that would become computationally too complex. So the way we deal with this is by introducing scaling laws uh, with respect to observed quantities. And the simplest way to tackle the problem is with power law scaling relations with respect to the observed total luminosity of the cluster members. So the velocity dispersion and the truncation radii of the various cluster members are obtained uh, with scaling power laws. The first one is also known as a Faber Jackson law uh, with respect to their observed luminosity. So we have to uh, optimize the scaling parameters and to decide the slopes of this law. The problem with this approach is that uh, lensing models are not that sensitive on how matter is distributed on such a small scale, and both they are sensitive to the total mass of cluster members, and both quantities influence uh, the total mass of members. So there's a strong degeneracy between the two. A way in which this degeneracy can be broken is by considering this first law, the Faber Jackson law, and taking advantage of the richness and depth of the MUSE data to measure line of sight velocity dispersions for a sizable subset of cluster members. We have them for uh, more than 50 cluster members in some cases. This was first done by Bergamini et al. in 2019. This is what they obtain again for other less than 63. These dots here, this is the velocity dispersion, measured velocity dispersion as a function of the, uh, of the total magnitude. These dots here are the data points. And if we use them to calibrate this relation, we obtain this green law. And uh, while the red and blue law represent the previously obtained laws without any kinematic priors, you see there's a clear shift, which indicates that the degeneracy has been broken and that at the fixed mass, uh, which is what the Lensing model finds, uh, we obtain higher values of sigmas and lower values of the truncation radius. So a good part of the degeneracy has been broken. However, it is still, in a way, a, a rather simple approach in the sense that uh, the mass and all the, all the quantities that define the mass distribution of the cluster members are determined with fixed power laws throughout the whole mass spectrum and with just one observed quantity. So we can do something more, and this is what we are trying to do now, which is uh, based on the fact that uh, the photometric data is deep enough uh, to measure structural parameters for the cluster members, in particular, the half light radius. And having both velocity dispersion and half light radii means that we can calibrate a more complex law than the Faber Jackson law, actually, a more fundamental law, the fundamental plane, of which a Faber Jackson law is actually just a projection. You see, in addition to the velocity dispersion, and uh, this is related to the magnitude, it's the average surface brightness within the half light radius, and this is the half light radius itself. So we have a sufficient sample of uh, members for which we have all three. And we can calibrate the fundamental plane and then use the best fit uh, parameters to measure, to estimate the velocity dispersion of all members uh, from the structural parameters with a more complex law. So in this way, we derive sigma for all members and fix it with a more realistic law and from two observed quantities instead of just one and with a fixed power law. And what do we obtain with this? Well, I, I forgot to say that instead for the truncation radius, we use the optimization of the model to calibrate a, a relation with the observed half light radius. What do we obtain with this? So now the mass is determined from two quantities that are uh, themselves determined in two independent ways, particularly the velocity dispersion that has a new scaling law, a more accurate scaling law. And if we plot the total mass of the cluster members, 
as a function of their velocity dispersion, you see that compared to the power law approach uh, with the new fund approach uh, based on the fundamental plane, which is represented by the blue point, we obtain a different scaling relation, but above all, a more realistic scaling relation with the inclusion of a scout. So we can extract, extract from the models more and more meaningful information, not just on the total mass of cluster members, but also on how it's distributed, which allows us to do a step forward and compare the mass distribution of custom members with what uh, cosmological simulation suggests us. And in recent years, cosmological simulations have been enriched by uh, baryonic particles and by uh, taking uh, and by, by describing the interplay between baryons and dark matter in shaping uh, cluster halos, for instance, with star formation, supernova, and AGM feedbacks. So, what we can do is we can start from our best fit lensing models extract the physical properties of the, of the subhalos in the best fit model, and then do the same with simulated clusters, taking 2D projections to simulate the observational conditions we have in Lensing. And what do we find if we compare uh, the uh, physical properties of the subhalos in the two cases? Well, we find that, they, uh, that the stellar to total mass fractions agree pretty well. We find similar values for them in the two cases. Where we find a discrepancy is instead in the compactness of the substructure. This was first reported by Menegetti tool in 2020 that found that subhalos in lensing models are more compact at, at a fixed mass than their simulated counterpart. And this is represented by this plot where we plot the maximum circular velocity. This is a concentration scale uh, related to the velocity dispersion of subhalos as a function of the total mass. So the black line is what we derive from a gold sample of lensing models, while these points, these data points, are subhalos extracted from simulations. And you see how there's a clean, clear offset. If we take a fixed total mass, a total subhalo mass, uh, simulated substructures are, have a lower maximum circular velocity and are therefore less compact. So we, of course, we are wondering well, what might be the reason for this discrepancy. The first question is, well, maybe uh, there are some issues in the choices that we make while parameterizing the cluster members. And so the first question is, uh, do we obtain the same result if we change the parameterization using, for instance, the fundamental plane instead of fixed power laws as was done for all the models included here? Well, we repeat the same plotting. Again, in, in, in red, you had the paper jackson approach and in blue, uh, the new fundamental plane approach. You see the two laws look a bit different. There's a, quite a significant scatter here. But there's no, hop, there's no offset between the two. So the discrepancy is still there. The discrepancy is indeed confirmed. So many other tests can be done in terms of strong lensing models uh, to, to find other reasons. But it could be that uh, other reasons may be at, uh, at, to blame for this discrepancy. For instance, the basis on which we build the simulations. Maybe uh, we don't understand uh, in, in a complete way the interplay between baryons and dark matter while shaping. Uh, the halos in clusters. So maybe there's some problems with the resolution of the simulations, although there are already some tests on this and uh, this seems to be ruled out. Or well, finally, there's something deeper if no smoking gun is found neither in lensing models nor in simulations. Maybe uh, there's something we don't fully understand in our hypothesis on the uh, nature of dark matter itself. These are open questions which I'll uh, leave you with. And I'll also take the last minute to leave you with a couple of take-home messages, which is that first, I hope I've convinced you that strong lensing is uh, very effective and accurate at determining and mapping the mass distribution of dark matter in massive in the course of massive galaxy clusters. And the great progress in the last few years has been driven by the increase in availability and depth of spectrography, particular and photometry, but particular, particularly integral field spectrography. Uh, great progress can be made looking particularly at the cluster members, for instance, taking advantage of the morphology and the kinematics that we can observe, but more steps forward can be made. For instance, uh, we could try to use the spectrography to build dynamical models of the cluster members and find a completely independent probe of the mass density profile. Uh, data uh, are, are not still deep enough, but might be in the near future. But anyway, uh, right now, as I showed you, in, as I've shown you with those discrepancies, our picture of the interplay between baryons and dark matter during the formation and evolution of clusters may be incomplete, and better strong lensing models are a good way to uh, test what might be uh, behind this discrepancy. These are the take home messages that I'd like to leave you with. So, thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you so much, Giovanni. That was a really lovely talk. And thank you so much for staying exactly within the allocated time. Um, you can ask questions now either by raising your hand in Zoom or using the chat function. Um, if you follow us on YouTube, you can also ask your questions in the YouTube chat, which will then be forwarded to the Zoom session. So don't hesitate to ask all the questions you have on Galaxy Clusters now. <laughs> While everybody's getting their, their questions ready, maybe I can start with one. Um, so I come from a completely different field of physics, but I do enjoy instrumentation and reproducibility a lot. So my question would be, um, do you consider um, the target that you looked at right now at the beginning of your PhD, like a typical galaxy cluster target? Do you expect to see something else um, once you get your hands on, on a different data set? Because as far as I saw in the archive, this is the first time that um, you're able to really push the uncertainty boundary this low. So maybe um, it's not as comparable to data that you've already seen. Uh, so the cluster itself is uh, relatively simple in the sense that, as you see, as one BCG and a relatively regular morphology compared to others is still a post-merger cluster. So it's not as simple, but uh, clusters such as MaxJ0416 are indeed as I showed you before, more complex. Uh, however, you see they have several BCGs and more complex morphology. However, um, the, the same data that we have for uh, Abel S1063 is available for these types of clusters. So it's, I think, more of a matter of uh, taking more time uh, to, to build a Lansing model. But, well, uh, the new Lansing model that will be published of Max J0416 uh, will be very accurate and probably push even further the boundaries of, uh, of accuracy. So uh, it's considered, um, but there are a few more for which we have similar similar data, at least nice. from Deer Fields clusters. Thank you. Um, besides, uh, we want to do um, we want to do proof of concepts on easy targets anyway. There's another there's another question in the Zoom chat um, from Avinash Chaturvedi. What kind of dark matter profile do you observe in modeling of the galaxy cluster? So uh, this is something that uh, by itself, strong lensing can't answer completely in the sense that strong lensing is limited. I will move on to I have a backup slide, which might be useful. Uh, well, first, this is useful in the sense that strong lensing, as I said, is mostly useful in this radial region. Uh, in the, the diffuse dark matter halos of the clusters exceed the cluster core. So if we want to understand what is the slope in the outer regions, uh, we need other methods such as galaxy dynamics or caustics. So we are still limited to the inner regions. Uh, so it's not easy to, to distinguish exactly the radial profile in the outskirts. But what we can do is ask ourselves whether uh, dark matter halos uh, do have a core in the center that can be done uh, with Lansing models. And well, uh, by now it has been become increasingly clear that most strong Lansing models of cluster fail. So you don't want, I don't know why I jumped here, but favor the presence of a central core, at least statistically. So uh, this is an arc second. Uh, this in blue is what we find in terms of posterior probability distribution for a core radius for our uh, new model with a fundamental plane. This is what they obtained earlier with uh, the power law approach. So you see, we also reduce the, uh, the uncertainty on this. And we find, uh, so in kiloparsecs, this is an, a core radius of around 80 kiloparsecs plus or minus three five. So surely not compatible with zero. So can we say that Lansing surely favors the presence of a core in the center of dark matter halos of clusters? Not necessarily because that's a region where there's the BCG and it's hard to distinguish between the two, we need to build more accurate dynamic models of the BCG to be sure. So I'd like, uh, so the, the final answer is uh, lensing, strong lensing could be useful to test whether there might be a core in the central part of uh, diffuse dark matter halos of clusters. Thanks, Giovanni. Okay, I think um, we have a little bit more time just for a quick question from somebody who raised a hand in the chat. I saw Jianhang Chen, if you wanna maybe unmute yourself and ask it. Yeah, Diana, thanks again for the very nice talk. It's a huge amount of work. 
Um, it's also not my area, so I'm, I just want to ask a very naive question. It is that in such a crowded field, how can you identify the multiple images of one um, background galaxies? Uh, usually with the spectroscopic redshift, that's the that's the main uh, the main smoking gun in the sense that they are extremely accurate. So we expect that we if we see multiple images of, of the same object that have the same redshift. This is of course easier when you have like Lyman alpha emissions at the high redshift because you see the line and measure the redshift accurately. And that's the way they are identified by comparing the redshifts. Okay. Great. Thank you yeah. so much you. for the questions and to Giovanni for, for answering. And um, there are still some questions in the chat. So Giovanni, feel free to hop in there and answer. Otherwise I'll hand over to Alice to introduce the second speaker of today. Thank you, Julia. Yes, so the second speaker of today will be Sofia rojas Ruiz, and she's a PhD student at MPIA in Heidelberg. And today she will talk us to us about the role of powerful radio jets in the host galaxy of a quasar in the first giga year of the universe. So the floor is yours, Sophia, please go ahead. Okay, let me know if you can see my screen now. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Great. So, thank you very much, uh, Alicia, for the introduction. Thanks to all the organizers for giving me the opportunity of giving this talk today at the Ipatia Colloquium. Um, so, uh, today I want to tell you about the role of powerful radio jets in a quasar in the first billion years of the universe, and um, this is based on some work I presented last year with my collaborators. And uh, at the end of the talk, I'll focus a little more on what else can we do with this awesome quasar. Um, so first, I want to put you into perspective of what really this quasar is. Uh, so quasar is really just this type of galaxy, a very powerful galaxy with a supermassive black hole in the center and that is accreting a bunch of stuff. And this accretion generates a jet. And now, depending on the angle where you see this jet, we call this object differently. If you see the jet directly towards your line of sight, then it's called a blazer. Uh, but if you see it at an angle, it will be a radio loud quasar, uh, something very, very powerful, very bright, or a radio galaxy. And for instance, in the local universe, um, M87 is a very nice example of um, a very supermassive black hole of like 10 to a 9 solar masses with evidence of a jet, as you can see here in this image from Hubble. Now, this is really an, uh, an incredible, incredible uh, black hole, very massive. It has a jet. And do we really see this type of ob objects in the early universe? And I specifically focus on studying the early universe. So here I show you an image of the different time scales of the evolution of the early universe, beginning with the cosmic microwave background at 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And the universe evolves uh, throughout time until now that it's like 13.5 billion years old or so. Uh, but when we look at the early universe, the high redshift astronomers use a different time scale called redshift. Um, so we define redshift zero with this letter uh, set. Redshift zero is here as like in the Milky Way. And as we look back in time, um, we increase the number of the redshift. And I specifically focus on studying um, the epoch of reionization, which is a very interesting time of the universe when the very first assembly of stars into galaxies um, begin to ionize the neutral hydrogen where the universe was submerged on. This is why in this image, you see these blobs of galaxies with a bubble around them that represents like the ionizing bubble. And actually there, is, there are quasars. <laughs> you can definitely see an image of a quasar here. It's one of the most high redshift quasars. And indeed, in this epoch, we have observed over 300 quasars. So up to 1 billion years, we have observed a lot. So yes, we do observe these powerful objects. 
However, it's very hard to explain how you can create such a supermassive black hole of 10 to the solar masses and uh, how it has time to launch a jet. And all these time scales are rushing when you are in the early universe because you just created the first few stars and the first few galaxies. So it's very interesting to study this specifically in the early universe. Um, and for this, I want to focus on the radio loud quasar population of quasars. That is where you see the most the effects of the jet. So we defined an object as radio loud when um, we observe it in a uh, first frame <laughs> radio and also optical. And if this ratio um, is more than 10, then we call this a radio loud object. Now, out of all the 300 um, quasars I showed before, only 12 of them have uh, been seen to be radio loud. And you might wonder why is this such a small population is like 10%. Well, because not all of the quasars we found that have been found mainly using um, photometry or colors in different bands, uh, not all of them have been studied in radio. They haven't been followed up. So there was this great effort in Banyado Cedal 2018, where they grabbed a bunch of these quasars and they followed them up in radio. However, out of all of them, really just uh, a handful uh, were uh, proven to be very radio loud, so above this line of 10. So there is indeed interesting to study the different properties. What can this population be different to a radio quiet population of quasars. And uh, precisely in this work, I focus a little more on studying how the jets of the a quasar can affect the host galaxy. And specifically, I focus on study this quasar P3215, uh, very much, very, very radio loud, which is a very interesting laboratory in the early universe because it's the only one at such a high redshift uh, of about uh, six or 5.83 <laughs> um, that presents evidence for jets, as you can see in this VLBA image. And the jets expand to about 1.6 kiloparsecs. So it's very, very interesting because besides uh, looking at the influence, influence of jets in the host galaxy, we can study these time scales of black hole accretion and jet launch that are like rushing to happen in the beginning of the universe. <clears throat> so to tell you a little bit more of the background of this quasar, um, it had been studied before uh, when it was discovered, it was found um, with uh, observations in the UV optical. And in this part of the spectral energy distribution, you are really looking at what is happening very close to a black hole. So the accretion of uh, the accretion disk. And um, if you go towards uh, longer wavelengths, um, you can study the cold dust from the host galaxy in the rest far infrared emission. And also, uh, if you go towards the radio, uh, you study the synchrotron emission that is uh, the one that is produ being produced by these jets. So specifically in the study of uh, last year in 2021, I focused on studying this relationship of jets into the cold dust uh, of the host galaxy. So to begin, uh, in the beginning of the discovery of this quasar, there was a lot of discrepancy in the low frequency end of the emission in radio. And this was a problem because we think that uh, synchrotron emission is proven by following a power law where the flux is proportional to a frequency to this slope uh, of alpha, that is the MCT index of the synchrotron. And um, we had to definitely know what was this slope. So we grabbed um, observations <laughs> focused at 215 megahertz with the GMRT telescope. And we have very clear uh, detection and observations that had allowed us uh, to grab the slope of the synchrotron emission. And we constrained it to be minus 0 0.88. And with this slope, we are able to constrain better the radio loudness of this quasar. That is indeed in the thousands, whether we use the 4,400 angstrom or 2,500 angstrom definition which is very cool because this is really uh, one of the most uh, radio loud sources in the early universe by like orders of magnitude compared to others. 
And now we can move on to look at the uh, observations in the millimeter. So for this, we had um, emission um, in NOIMA at 100 gigahertz. And also with ALMA, we got a discontinuum emission at 290 gigahertz. Now for people who are not very familiarized with radio observations, um, this blob of emission is covering all the jet uh, high resolution we had seen before from the VLBA image. As you can see, this emission, for instance, in ALMA is like 5.8 kiloparsecs, whereas the jet was like 1.6 kiloparsecs. So everything is inside this emission. And the cross represents the optical um, emission of the AGN itself, of the black hole. So we have these two observations in the millimeter where we study the rest far infrared emission. And um, for this, we typically use a modified black body function to model the cold dust. And this has been used for radio galaxies and radio quiet quasars. And uh, typical dust temperatures that have been used uh, were 47 Kelvin. And the dust emissivity index beta, that basically tells you a little bit of the shape of your dust grains, um, this was uh, found to be uh, 1.6. Um, but as you can see in my fit here, it doesn't fit both data points we have. So what I tried was ranging different temperatures of uh, representative of cold dust. So from 30 to 100 Kelvin is okay. If you go to more than 100 Kelvin, you're getting into hot dust where you study something different. Um, so I ranged that. And also I, I tried another emissivity index that has been used for radio quiet quasars that is 1.95. However, same story, we cannot fit these two data points. And actually, the NOIMA at 100 gigahertz is consistently one order of magnitude higher than any of these models. So now what we can do is look on the other side of the spectrum that we had studied before, that is the synchrotron emission. Um, so we extrapolated the slope of minus 0.88 that I had found before. And what we see is that still the 100 gigahertz doesn't really follow the same type of emission. It's like three times lower than what it should be. Um, and what this tells us already is that there is, uh, at, at 100 gigahertz, there is um, emission from synchrotron and also from dust. Both of them are like intertwined in some way. And that also tells us that it's a break in the synchrotron spectrum because it doesn't follow minus 0.88, but it goes down at some point. Um, however, so far, we only have observations between 3 gigahertz here in yellow and the 100 gigahertz. Uh, that seems to be the interesting one. But this already tells us that, indeed, the jets are affecting the host galaxy because they're affecting the continuum emission that we um, <clears throat> are expecting to be lower. So this is very cool. And also, uh, there is tantalizing evidence of perhaps a C plus outflow. Um, we obtained one hour observations of high resolution with ALMA to look at the C plus. Now, in one hour, you really don't get very good signal to noise. It was like two or four in, in general. However, what we do see is that the C plus emission here represented in like orange does follow the same inclination as that of the jet that we see from the VLBA image. So what this tells us is that maybe this is a C plus radio driven outflow. However, we will definitely need better signal to noise in order to uh, rectify this and study much better if um, the jet is actually having a lot of influence in this um, gas from the host galaxy. However, from what we have right now, that is this um, probable break in the synchrotron, we can focus on studying um, some different time scales. For instance, the time scales of the jet launch and the supermassive black hole accretion. So focusing first on the time scale of the jet, we can measure how, for how long this jet uh, has been launched. So here I have a picture of uh, a black hole that is accreting. And during this accretion, it ionizes its surrounding in uh, UV radiation and also creates a magnetic field that is rotating all the time, as you see here. And the electrons that are being launched, they wrap around this magnetic field, uh, like in this um, orange arrow. 
and they keep flying like that all the time. So in the beginning, you have a lot of these electrons that are being launched recently from the recent black hole accretion. And um, with time, you will be launching less and less of these electrons. Now, um, what we know is that the electrons lose energy at a rate that is proportional to their energy squared. What this means is that the highest energy electrons will be losing energy much faster than any other um, at lower frequencies. And this reflects directly in the spectrum you have from the synchrotron. And this is why you can see uh, a break because the highest energy electron um, that you had produced in the beginning is not being produced anymore after center in time. And since you're not injecting more of these electrons, then simply your slope goes down. This is what is actually happening. And there has been a lot of uh, studies uh, based on this, I'm presenting here like Carilli et al, 1991, or Jaffe, et cetera. Um, but specifically, we see that by measuring this break frequency, you can know uh, the synchrotron age. So here in this equation that is presented specifically in Carilli et al, 1991, we see some ingredients that we need to find this jet age. One of them is the magnetic field B, which uh, can be constrained from the VLBA observations where you have a very high resolution of the jet. So you can look at the flux on the different hotspots of the jet. And with that, you can um, constrain a magnetic field that was found to be about 3.5 milligauss, which is super, super powerful. Because if you compare this to local radio galaxies like Cygnus A, et cetera, it's on the order of micro gauss. So this is bright. <laughs> this is very powerful uh, jet. Uh, but then your second ingredient is precisely this frequency break that we seem to observe. However, we don't know exactly what it is. But um, what we understand is that if these frequency breaks occur in uh, the highest frequencies, for instance, following the KP model, if we predict that it is at 36 um, gigahertz, then this gives you a very young jet age of about 500 years. But if you assume a different model where you inject electrons in a different way and your break occurs at lower frequencies, for instance, 7 gigahertz, then your jet is already uh, much older because uh, it's been more time of this spectrum going down. So indeed, we can uh, learn the jet age if we just pinpoint specifically where this frequency break is happening. And that is why I led this VLA uh, proposal where we want to, we observed already <laughs> with um, all the available bands of the VLA, uh, the emission from this quasar. So we repeated observations at 1.4 and 3 gigahertz, all the way to 45 gigahertz, where we are hoping to definitely see um, a break in the frequency of the synchrotron emission. And with that, we can definitely find a synchrotron age for this quasar. So this is one important time scale. And uh, as a quick summary, we already have then studied this quasar in radio and in the far infrared, where we see that possibly at one gigahertz, we're having a combination of both. Now, we also have information in the UV optical where we can study the accretion disk or the supermassive black hole accretion. So uh, one way of knowing for how long this quasar has been accreting is measuring the quasar lifetime, or TQ. That basically tells you um, how the black hole accretion responds to the ionizing power that it has. So in this image, I'm showing you the quasar, basically in this position. And in the upper panel, I show the neutral fraction, which will start to lower once the, the quasar turns on, basically when it starts accreting and it will start ionizing its surrounding. Now, this is a movie of a quasar at redshift six, so about one billion years uh, of the universe. And the dotted line represents the continuum emission that you will see of the quasar if you were sitting in front of it and there was no absorption from the neutral hydrogen that we know is uh, very dominant in the early universe in the epoch of ionization. So that is why uh, this neutral hydrogen is absorbing a lot of this um, emission in the left side of what we call the Lyman break here at 1216 angstrom. And this is why you don't see anything uh, in, the, in this left side. 
But what happens when you turn on the quasar? So the quasar turns on, the, you start ionizing your surrounding, the neutral fraction goes down, and of course, you start to see emission on this left side now because you're breaking these clouds of neutral hydrogen. So if we measure specifically how big uh, is this um, radius of emission that we're now seeing, we call this the proximity zone. And if we measure how much the, of this proximity zone there is, we directly measure how much your ionizing bubble is growing. And this can tell us this um, factor of quasar lifetime that measures for how long the black hole has been accreting. And specifically for our quasar, we have high signal to noise extruder observations um, where we want to measure the proximity zone. So this is preliminary data from extruder where we're trying to measure exactly how big is this proximity zone to get this quasar lifetime. But in summary, this means that we already can uh, find the time scale of jet launch and black hole accretion, and we can compare them. So if we find that the quasar lifetime is similar to a synchrotron age from the jet, then what we basically see is that you turn on the quasar, you start growing your ionizing bubble, and at the same time, you're launching your jet. And uh, this is probably what we think will happen uh, based on theories of how we think black hole and jet launch happen. But also it can be a case that we find the quasar lifetime to be um, longer, meaning that you turn on the quasar, you start growing your ionizing bubble, and then sometime later, you start growing uh, the jets. And lastly, there is another possibility of seeing that the quasar lifetime is actually smaller than the synchrotron age. And the only way this will happen is if you first have some accretion of the black hole, your jet is launched, uh, but then there is um, the, the quasar turns off. Basically, there's no more accretion for some reason, which basically allows neutral hydrogen to have recombination. And their recombination time is much faster. It's in the order of hundreds of years or so, or maybe thousands of years. Um, but then the, your, your jet keeps growing. The jet keeps growing. Uh, but then you have a second like um, accretion time, and then you start to see your ionizing bubble grow. So these are the three possible scenarios that we can study specifically only with this quasar, which is why it's very, very interesting to do. Now, I'm going to leave you with a summary. So, so far, I've studied very well the radio and millimeter uh, spectrum of this quasar. And we found that at 100 gigahertz with the NEMA observations, there seems to be a combination of synchrotron and continuum emission from the host galaxy which immediately tells us about a break in the synchrotron spectrum, which is great because this is one of the ingredients we need to measure the age of the jet and compare that to the quasar lifetime. And maybe in the future, if we get uh, high resolution ALMA observations of the C+, we could um, rectify this possible C+, outflow. So thank you very much for listening and I can take your questions. Thank you very much for a very nice talk, Sophia. And the floor is now open to questions. So if you have any, please feel free to raise your hand on Zoom or to type your question in the chat or in the chat on YouTube as well. So I see that we already have two on Zoom. Please go ahead, Yang Yang. Hi, Sophia. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you. <laughs> Very nice talk. Yeah, so my first question is that do you also have applied the ALMA observation at different bands so you could also constrain the dust SED better? Yeah, so the answer is no. So um, it is a possibility. I'm just showing this slide to explain. So we have this um, ALMA observation so far, right? This cross, and there is a possibility of going a little bit towards um, higher frequencies or lower wavelengths with ALMA to get another data point here to constrain at least better the, the modified black body function, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, no, I had not done this before, but it's definitely in in my list <laughs> to write a proposal for that, yeah. Great. And uh, my second question is that I'm still not fully understand how you constrain the magnetic field um, strength in the jet. So from your VLBI observation, do you also have the polarized observation or it's just based on your the intensity of the, the radio jets? 
is based on the intensity of the radio lobes that we see, um, for instance, uh, let me think. Yeah, on this image. Yeah, so uh, based on the flux you see from these radio spots, uh, you can constrain the magnetic field, but it's indeed very hard. It is very hard. What will be best is to also have observations in X-ray, um, which at high resolution is also hard to get with the current observatories in X-ray. We have like Chandra, etc. Um, because once you have both uh, fluxes in X-ray and radio, you can constrain much better the, the magnetic field. And just very briefly, if you want to see some equations, it's, it's much more complex than you think, because uh, yes, yeah, so this is the big equation, which depends definitely on the flux in radio. Uh, but there's a lot of things you have to assume, like this kappa and eta uh, parameter. So indeed, in any type of radio source, a radio galaxy, even in the local universe, it's very hard to constrain the magnetic field. But we work with what we can. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah. No, thank you. <laughs> work, yeah. Okay, then there's another question in on Zoom from Alonso. Yep. Uh, hi, Sofia. Thank you very much for the very clear uh, presentation. And my question is a bit more general, is that if, if you or, or your team are planning to, to merge your, with observation from the JWST, or how can your work be benefited by, by that? Yes. So um, yes, with JWST, we can do a lot of things, especially if we care about looking at this um, influence in the host galaxy, we can also look at O3 outflows besides the C plus outflow. And that we can do uh, with JWST. So yes, there is uh, specifically for studying, you know, the host galaxy specifically, you, you can see here uh, maybe <laughs> with the wavelength at to on the top. Uh, yes, this can be covered by James Webb, and it will be super, super interesting to see not only a C plus, but something else like O3. Wonderful, thanks. You're welcome. And we also have a question from YouTube. Marcello Giroletti is asking, what is the advanced velocity of the VLB jet based on its linear size and the estimated synchrotron age, assuming this coincides with the jet lifetime? Right, so yes, from the VLBA observation, um, I'll put this image to cover. So yes, from this VLBA uh, observation, and I can directly redirect you to Mom General 2018, um, they assume a speed of the jet of 0 0.2 times the speed of light. And uh, based on that, they get a kinematic age of about 10 to a four years. Um, so yeah, we'll see if this matches our synchrotron age. But yeah, there's already some constraint at least uh, from this VLBA observation. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions? Yes, please go ahead, Giacomo. Yeah, uh, Sofia, uh, thank you, Alicia. I have, uh, just to be, I mean, again, for me, this is completely out of my field of interest, but I found absolutely fascinating this, uh, this impressive combination of the, of the uh, wavelength telescopes uh, techniques. I mean, the, the amount of data and information you, you processed for the, to study this quasar is really uh, remarkable. And I was wondering how, so how many studies like this you can do basically? Uh, so how, uh, you see, I, mean, it's, I, I don't know, how many candidates are there to do such a, such a beautiful and detailed study and, and What's your plan in that sense? Uh... Yeah, so, so far, um, I mentioned a little bit in, earlier in the talk, really, this is the only quasar where we see evidence of jet. Um, now, this doesn't mean that, of course, all the regular quasars have a jet as well, uh, but maybe there hasn't been, because this one was so radio loud, so if we, if we look at how this was measured in the SCORI paper. This was like super high up here. So oh, it was the most, maybe the most interesting to follow up with high resolution. 
Um, but yeah, this doesn't mean that other quasars also have this effect of jets, but this is indeed the first, so my paper 2021, it was the first uh, one to study the possible influence of this radio loud population in the host galaxy. But there are more that are coming up. <laughs> um, and you can also see in, in these other radio loud quasars, the effect of the spectrum going down in the synchrotron spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if that can already be seen, if these objects have been observed with other radio telescopes, so it will be interesting to follow them up and see if, like if they actually have a jet. And for those that have a, um, a spectrum break, what they need to study then is the magnetic field. And that you can get with high resolution observations. So, so far, this is the only ideal laboratory we have. But of course, the high rigid people are trying to <laughs> get more observations. Good. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Congratulations. Also. Of course. Thanks. Great. Is there any more questions for Sofia? Seems like there is none. So I think I can thank you again uh, on behalf of everyone who listened to your beautiful talk. And thank you to all of you who contributed to the discussion. And I will now give the floor back to Giacomo. Yes, thank you, Alicia. Well, for me, just to close the event, to first of all, congratulate Sofia and Giovanni. Congratulations, a very beautiful talks and great job and good luck for the next day here, I mean, for your talks and, and your career. Congratulations. Don't forget to please send your contribution for the for the proceedings booklet. And for Alice and uh, Julia, thank you for, for sharing the session. Great, great job. Congratulations. Thank you very much. And also, I want to especially thank Alonso and uh, Jan Hank because they are, I wanted to mention, they are PhD students at ESO. And it, it's a pleasure for, for us all to see this contribution from young astronomers. It is really a joy to see, to watch, and congratulations, great questions. And thanks for making the event so so nice and so warm. Thank you very much. And so professional at the same time. So thank you to all of you. Thank you for the participants and uh, see you in a week from now. And see you. Thank you. Bye.